You're listening to Menopause Natural Solutions, episode 80, Unjunk Your Junk Food with Andrea Donsky. Welcome to Menopause Natural Solutions, your podcast for all things perimenopause, menopause and beyond. Stay tuned as your host, naturopath Jennifer Harrington, explains how to use natural therapies to find your ultimate health and happiness during your transition. Hello ladies. Welcome back to Menopause Natural Solutions. I'm your host and naturopath, Jennifer Harrington. And today I have with me Andrea Donsky. Andrea is a registered holistic nutritionist with over 20 years of experience. She's the founder of naturallysavvy.com. The author of Unjunk Your Junk Food has been named in the top 100 health influences. And more recently, she has created a new podcast, Morphous for Menopause Reimagined, which is a no judgment zone movement where women in menopause can feel heard, safe, and supported. Andrea, it's so wonderful to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. It is so great to be on your show this time. Last time you were on mine, and now I'm on yours. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm actually really excited you could find time to fit us in today because you've got so much on your plate. I'm especially excited about Morphous. Before we get into today's content, do you think you could briefly explain what Morphous is? I can. Thank you for asking, Jen. So Morphous is a community of women in perimenopause and menopause, and it's going to be a website, a podcast, we have a Facebook page, and it's just a place where women can feel supported, never judged, and also learn from each other and from experts in our community. So I'm a holistic nutritionist, as you mentioned off the top, and I have been spending the last three years of my life really researching and understanding women as they go into perimenopause and menopause. So I am so excited to be launching Morphous and to be able to help women and work alongside women like yourself, Jen. Like I love what you do with your podcast and your book and your, you know, everything that you're doing to help women, your practice together, we can help other women. We, we can teach and they can learn from us and we can learn from them so that together it can just make it a little bit easier as we transition into this new phase of life. So it's it's a very um, valuable resource that I myself have actually watched and gone to. So ladies, if you haven't checked it out, please make sure you do. And I'll add it all into the show notes at the end. So you can always go and click the link. Today, we were going to talk about unjunking your food. Yeah. Yes. My favorite so, topic. <laughs> would you like to um, tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, sure. So Unjunk Your Junk Food I wrote when I was having kids. So I'm 51 now and my son is now 17, which he was really the inspiration behind Unjunk Your Junk Food. And he, we would go to parties or we, you know, birthday parties or events. And I would always see, you know, back when we were actually out and, and going out and about, and we would go and he would be like, like gravitating towards all of these brightly colored candies or all the chocolate on the table, which kids do, right? And my mom in seek was like, no, I don't want you to have that. He was probably about four years old, one event in particular that stands out for me. And I didn't want him to eat it, but my dad, who was at the party with us, said, Andrea, you have to let him be a kid. You have to let him eat the junk food. And I remember thinking to myself, it, it's not so much, I know junk food has sugar, but that's, it, what, that's not what was bothering me. What was bothering me were other things that I later learned that were food coloring or artificial flavors or you know things like trans fats, hydrogenated fats. So my gut instinct was right. And many years later, when I wrote on Junk Your Junk Food, which was in 2011, I realized that there are so many ingredients in the food that we're eating. And that book was particular about junk, particular about junk food is that we should be avoiding these foods because they are causing issues to our health. And that's really what gave me the inspiration behind writing it. Mm. Yes. As a mum myself, I 100% know <laughs> what you're talking about. And some of those changes, it's not just instant at the party. You take them home and sometimes it's, you know, 12, 24 hours later, they're still getting some of these chemicals out of their system and they're young and they have better detoxification. Well, in most most places 
they have better abilities to detoxify because they're young and they haven't been around as long in this toxic planet. So when we look at, at women going through menopause, we generally have quite a big burden on detoxification already. So it's an mm-hmm. even bigger issue for us now than, than it was when, when we were children. And even when we were children, the number of these chemicals were significantly lower than, than they are now. So I think it's a great chance to, to have this discussion. And I know you talk about seven. Is it seven that you, you like to avoid? Yeah. So we call them the scary seven. I'm actually going to add an eighth because I wrote the book, like I said, in 2011, but doing all the research that I've been doing specifically on menopause and finding out what, you know, foods that we should avoid and foods that are actually good for us. I'm going to add one more at the eighth. So uh, make sure that you stick around to the end because it's not going to be scary seven plus one. So we're adding on one more. (laughs) So I want to start with, if it's okay with you, I'll start with the number one scary ingredient, scary seven ingredient, and that is glucose fructose or high fructose corn syrup. And it is found in so many processed and ultra processed foods. So the reason why high fructose corn syrup, or if you live in, is it the same in Australia, Jen? I know I'm in Canada. It's glucose fructose. So the thing about glucose fructose is that we know that it can lead to heart disease, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, which is insulin resistance. So these are the reasons we want to be staying away from this particular ingredient. And the reason companies use it is because it's a sugar. And in many cases, it's a cheaper sugar to be able to use. And it's found in everything. I mean, it's so hard to Mm. find bread here on the shelf that doesn't contain glucose fructose or high fructose corn syrup. Wow. And I've, I've seen a lot of links to it with brain fog and co- cognitive issues, which is something else that women um, generally complain about going through their transition. So it, it can be linked into what you're drinking, what you're eating. Are you having high corn fructose? Um, is this part of the problem? Yeah, it's a really, and it's big, it's everywhere. I mean, you really, you can find it in everywhere. So that would be my first one. The second one would be trans fats. So anything mm-hmm. that has partially hydrogenated oils and we all, like, all experts agree. There is no, there's no like, nobody disagrees with the fact that we know that trans fats can lead to heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So this is something that is really important. So when you're looking at a label and you're shopping, look for anything that says partially hydrogenated oils. So, and it also something called datum, which is D-A-T-E-M could be an issue as well as mono and diglycerides. So these are things that we really want to be mindful of when we're eating. And the nice thing is, and, and even as we're going through this list, Jen, is that there are foods that don't have it. So if you're choosing organic foods, which I know you talk about a lot, so you're choosing foods that don't have these poor ingredients in them, there are options and alternatives, which is why we wrote Unjunk Your Junk Food, is because here's option A that has it, but here's op- option B that tastes probably even better than option A that doesn't contain it. So make that healthier choice is which we, why we try to inspire people to do that because it's healthier, mm-hmm. right? Well, I would even say option C is to make it at home because <laughs> if you're yeah. making it at home, you know what ingredients you're using and you just don't use those toxic ingredients in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And the issue with ta- with option C, and by the way, I advocate always option C, number one, 100%. Yeah. But, you know, in the real world is we're busy. A lot of us are tired. We don't feel like always starting things from scratch at the end of the day. So if we're going to buy packaged foods, which I even do myself, right? I mean, I'm not always cooking from scratch. So when you are looking for that option, you know, option C is the best. But if you are looking for option B, looking for that healthier option and not, and not look, looking, learning how to read ingredients and the labels. And that's what the important thing that the book stresses is how to read a product label and avoid these harmful ingredients. Beautiful. A hundred percent in agreement. (laughs) So number three. So number three would be artificial flavors. So staying away from things that say, you know, strawberry flavor or vanillin. So you want to look for instead for things on the label that say natural flavors. Now there are some controversy around natural flavors. I'm okay with natural flavors because I don't want to go all the way to the left to basically say, you can't eat anything that doesn't, you know, even has a natural flavor. I'm okay if it says natural flavors, stay away from anything that says artificial flavor. And you'll generally see that on the front of the package and in the ingredients. So one of the things I talk about a lot, Jen, is I say, when we look at, when we're looking at a label, we pick up a product off the shelf, turn it around. When you look at that nutrition facts panel, don't go to the calories first. That's like, I like to joke. I'm like, that's so 2007. Like, don't look at the calories because it doesn't really matter how many calories the product has. 
go to the ingredient list, make sure that the ingredient list is nice and clean, you understand what you're reading, and then go to other things like the sugars and the fats, right? So those are what you want to go to secondary. But the most important thing is that you are re- eating those ingredients that our body recognizes. Like you mentioned before, our liver, our kidney, like our organs, as we get into menopause, they're not working as optimally, right? They've, they've led us and they've got us this far and they've done a great job. But unfortunately, for in many cases, they're not working as optimally. So we want to give our food, our body food that it can recognize so it can process it properly and then detox it properly. Yes, definitely. So next on your list was MSG, which in Australia, we quite often just have 621 on our food labels. Um, in, in Canada, in the US, do, do they put MSG or what's, what's in the labels over there? Yeah. So very, that's actually very interesting. I didn't know that. So yeah, in Canada and the US, they write MSG, well, they'll write monosodium glutamate, but there are other forms. There's upwards of 40 different types of MSG that you can find on a label, depending on how sensitive you are. So you can see it as yeast extract, autolyzed yeast extract. We have an entire list um, on naturallysavvy.com that you can go and you can look up names for MSG. So you'll see it in other forms, but MSG, and the reason why it's on the list is that it can lead to headaches, you know, fatigue, sweating, chest pain. Like there's some serious side effects and you'll know pretty quickly if you are somebody who is sensitive to MSG. And even if you don't, again, we recommend staying away from it, of course, because it does have a whole list of side effects that can affect us. And especially again, in menopause, where we tend to be a little bit more sensitive to ingredients. One of the, one of the things that be mindful of if you love eating chips, it's found in flavored chips. So soups, that's it. So it, it, it makes food taste better, right? So it's a flavor enhancer. So you'll find it a lot in salty products. So just be mindful again, when you're shopping, turn around, it, look, look on the back of the product, see if it's written in it. If it's not written in it, but you want to be hypervigilant, you can even just Google other names for MSG and you'll see all the different names that come up for it. So I'm one of these MSG sensitive people. And if I'm eating out, one of my favorite places to go is for Thai food to go and get Mm -hmm. myself a stir fry. And I have Thai restaurants that I know use MSG and I don't go there because it will be an instant headache before I've even finished the meal versus Mm -hmm. if I go to other places that I know and I, they make sure they don't put any MSG in, then it's a really wonderful experience. It's, it's a delicious stir fry that I only get benefit from. I don't go home with a, a nasty headache that puts me in bed for the rest of the day. So MSG can, but even if you're not suffering from the headaches, there is those downstream consequences. As we discussed, your liver still needs to process it. And um, yeah, yeah, this time of life, it's busy. It's busy trying to process all those hormones. And well, it's also, we're, we have so many signs and symptoms as we're in menopause. One of the things we did over the research over the last three years is we found that women in menopause and perimenopause, as you know, Jen, and I know you, you wrote your book, there are over 80, we have discovered over 85 different signs and symptoms of menopause and headaches being a, one of them. So if many of us already have certain issues as we're going into menopause, why exacerbate it with certain ingredients and foods that we're eating? That's the importance. And again, I know you talk about this in your book, which everyone should pick up. I have a copy myself. Is It's really important that we eat clean because the cleaner we eat, like I said before, the, the easier our body can process that food and the less prone we are to certain side effects Mm. but also the more nutrition when we're eating well we're getting more nourishment from the food which is the whole point of eating in the first place (laughs) a hundred percent that goes without saying (laughs) and choosing wisely right so yes our nutrient dense foods making choices making sure that we're getting our fruits and vegetables making sure that you're getting you know lean protein or not even so much lean there's other things we can talk about saturated fats right is it as bad as we once thought it was which now we know is not as bad as we once thought about Mm. it right so we're going to save again we're going to save the the eighth to the end which kind of brings all of this together the next scary seven ingredient I want to talk about uh, talk about Jen is artificial colors and this is really as a mom of three kids for me this is my nemesis like I if I see food with artificial colors in it for me it gets me so upset because my kids when they were young now they're older so I have two teens and I have a 10 year old and for me when my kids would eat anything with artificial colors they would literally we called it the crazies in our house because within 10 minutes they would be bouncing off the walls and it didn't matter what type of food coloring And, and in Canada this is different in the US but in Canada companies don't have to tell you the different types of food coloring they're using. They could just use the word color. 
So it's really easy to miss it on a label. So you really have to like look carefully to see if you word, you see the word color. Some companies will tell you if they're using yellow dye number five because they have to because of the allergies associated with it. But if you're in the US and you're listening, they'll tell you on the label because they have to all the different types of food coloring that is being used. So it's easier to spot if you are in the US. I don't know what it's like for, for you in Australia, Jen. Is it the same way? I think it's more like the US. They tend to write down what different colors that they've got in there. Yeah. See, that's great. So for me, that the whole connection to hyperactivity in kids with and without behavior problems, that is the main reason if you have young kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews and you're listening and you, if you, you know, if they're eating a lot of things with food coloring and then they have a lack of focus or you find that their behavior is like, they're a lot more hyper, that could be why is because of the food coloring that they're eating. Yeah. And there's never, there's never just one. There's never one color. There's there's multiple colors that they put in there. And I also tend to find it's not just the crazies, it's the crash afterwards. Mm, the blood sugar spike and fall, 100%. And there's some foods that are deceiving. So you think, for example, you look at a food like marshmallows, it's white, right? But you don't, you're like, okay, I'm going to avoid food coloring, but it actually has blue dye number one. So these are the things that we want to be mindful of, which always takes us back to reading the label and really understanding everything that you are that that's on the label that you're putting in your body and avoiding those, those harsher chemicals or additives, like I say. And if you were cooking at home, you're, you're not putting color in. (laughs) So uh, back to, you know, it's always best if you can cook from home, but it's good to have alternatives if you do. And because quite often we're, we're out and about, we're hungry. You, You can't cook when you're out and about and on the road, you want to go into the shop and grab something. So it is handy to know, what your, your safer options are. So, so thank you for doing the research and writing the book and, and making it easy for everyone out there. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, it really, I always say that I, the businesses that I've had, so I've had Naturally Savvy now for, it's, I think, 15 years, 13, 15 years, somewhere in that realm. And now when, with Morphis, it's always where I'm at in life. And when I started Naturally Savvy, I really was at the point where I was having my kids and I was raising a family. And now that I'm going into, now that I am in menopause, it's now all about understanding our bodies in this second or third phase of our life in terms of, okay, so what should we be eating? What are the nutrients that we need? What should we be avoiding? And just the last one on the scary seven list is avoiding ingredients like preservatives. So things like sodium benzoate or potassium sorbate, things that we don't necessarily, our body doesn't know how to process, which be, which be, would be the preservatives or nitrates, right? So these are the things just to be mindful of. Again, if we're going to round off that scary seven is to say, okay, so if I'm buying a food and I see that it has potassium sorbate in it or sodium benzoate, do I really need it? And is there another option? Because some people have allergic reactions to those ingredients. And getting back to cooking at home, when I'm cooking, any leftovers are rather frozen immediately or eaten within 24 hours. So when you're picking up a food and the expiry date is in a week or in a month or in a year, it, it's got to have preservatives and they have had to alter the food in some way in order for it not to go rancid or mouldy or, or off. Yeah, a hundred percent. So they're using, and not, not in all cases where they are, sometimes it's the, the, the technology that they're using to maybe they don't need those unnecessary preservatives, which is why I do love if you're going to have packaged or, or processed foods, right? Is why I love choosing the organic options better because they won't have those poor ingredients. They're not going to have artificial colors in organic, certified organic products, at least in Canada and the U S they won't have the, the horrible preservatives. They're not going to have the, the MSG in it, at least not the mon- of sodium glutamate they might have yeast extract but they're not going to have the you know the white powder that they're using or you can buy at the store good to know so what is number eight (laughs) (laughs) so number eight is probably one of my biggest passions now is avoiding seed oils so these are and this is something that i've been doing recently so i'm going to tell you a great story and how it came to be for me so i like i like we've talked about now for a bit is i'm a holistic nutritionist and i'm always trying to eat as best as I can, because that's what I do for a living. I teach people and I educate people. And one of the things that I was doing is I was buying these, this seaweed. I have this, we have this grocery store here and I was buying the seaweed and I was eating the seaweed and I was loving it because it's great for our thyroid, as you know, and our ovaries. And what was happening though, is I was feeling, I'd wake up in the morning and my body was just feeling inflamed. And I was like, my feet would hurt me when I come out and like, I would get up in the morning and I'm like, why am I feeling inflamed? And I wouldn't 
I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm eating as healthy as I can be. I'm paleo. I'm keto-ish. I'm kind of in the middle there. I'm avoiding grains. I'm like, what's going on? And then I was like, wait a minute, let me read the package. And it had sunflower oil. And then I would look at some other products that I had in my cupboard and it had canola oil and it had other seed oils like soy oil and all of these seed oils that are really cotton seed oil, right? That are not healthy for us that create inflammation in the body. And I removed it. I removed all of them from my diet. I am, I'm so particular about it right now. And Jen, just removing these seed oils from our, from my, from my diet had a massive change from the inflammation in my body and it went right down. And that to me now is my biggest passion too, because it's the scary seven plus one, because to me, understanding what these omega-6 seed oils are doing to our body is creating that inflammation. Now we all, you know, you always want a healthy balance, but what happens in at least North America, and I'm sure in Australia too, is we get so much omega-6, right? So we don't have that healthy balance. And that's what was causing inflammation for me. And that's why I just, I want to share with your audience is read the labels now to look at what type of oil. So we know that we want to save from trans fats, the partially hydrogenated oils, but now also read it. Does it have sunflower? Does it have safflower oil? Does it have canola oil? Does it have soy oil? Does it have cottonseed oil? What are the oils that they're using? And instead, put those back on the shelf, look for products. And this goes to what you were saying before, Jen, when we're cooking from home, using healthy oils like olive oil, like avocado oil, like coconut oil, like palm fruit oil. These are oils that are good for our body and that our body knows how to process. So with my patients, I actually test their omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and nobody, none of them have ever had the correct ratio. They Mm. have 100% all being high omega-6 and it is so inflammatory. So I am so happy that you've added that to the list because for some women, it makes a world of difference. It's that last little bit that takes away the air inflammation and makes them feel well again. So well done. <laughs> Thank you. And, and it all comes from my personal experience and, and also doing a lot of the research. So yeah, I'm happy that you agree with me. And yeah, I've had that test done too. And it's, it's a great test to have, especially if people can't figure out the source of the inflammation, right? That they're trying everything and they're doing everything right, but they're like, I don't really understand. So it's a great test to give your patients. It's awesome. And if we're looking at the body for signs, if you're the kind of person that has a whole lot of dry skin down the back of the arms or pimples down the back of the arms, this can also be a sign that there's an issue with the ratio of your oils. Yeah. And make sure that you're getting enough omega-3s, right? So if you eat fish, fish oil is fantastic. If you don't, then there's lichen oil. I believe it's pronounced lichen, which is from an algae. And then there's, so there's different, there's vegan sources of omega-3s as well. I recommend sea buckthorn oil. Do you get that in Canada? We do. It's it's three, six, seven, and nine. And seven is the one that helps to restore your mucous membrane integrity. So really good for dryness anywhere. So vaginal dryness, skin dryness, um, hair dryness, (laughs) dry eyes, dry sinus, dryness in general. That's awesome. Yeah. So any type of those good oils are what's going to help as well to reduce inflammation in the body. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. What, what, a, what a wonderful conversation that we've had today. Thank you so much for coming in and talking about these seven plus one scary food <laughs> additives. Was there anything, so you've also mentioned with food labeling, you always look at the ingredients first and something that we haven't mentioned is the order. So the first thing on the list is going to be what's the most, the, the greatest content within that food, working its way down to the bottom. And don't think because it's at the bottom, it's, it's okay, because it's still a chemical and it, it's still a small amount of a chemical is still a chemical. So generally you'll find a lot of your sugars up the top, but it depends on what, what the food is. And then you said after that to have a look at the second panel, which is looking at the calories, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats. Is there anything else that you recommend we look at with food labeling? 
I would say, you know, read the front of the package first and just be, I, my whole thing is just be, have wise, eyes wide open and just go in there knowing that companies have marketing tactics. They want you to buy their product over others on the shelf. And in many cases, I'll show these pictures that have a great story that there was a product here that, and from a very big packaged foods company, and they would show these beautiful plump strawberries on the front of the package. And you're like, oh my God, I think it was like granola bars or something. And then we're like, oh, that looks so good. That's incredible. I'm going to buy it. And you would turn it over and it didn't even have one strawberry. It had strawberry flavor and cranberry flavor. So companies can get away with saying certain things that you don't necessarily have to actually put in the product. So that's really what I want you to be mindful of is just eyes wide open when you're buying the products, turn it around, read the ingredient list, make sure that you understand it. Now there are certain things you may not understand that aren't necessarily harmful for you or bad for you, but just Try to read that label and then go again to, like I said, to the nutrition facts panel, then read how much sugar's in it. You really want to be mindful of how much sugar that you're taking in. We know the connection between sugar and blood sugar and insulin resistance, which most of us women in menopause, it's like 88% of the American population has insulin resistance. So only, it only goes up from there when we're in menopause. So we really want to be mindful of the sugars that we're taking in, the type of oils that we talked about, you know, so that kind of thing, the sodium, if that's something that, you know, is concerning to you. So all of these ingredients, that's kind of like the order that I would recommend, but everything needs to be taken into consideration, especially if you're not feeling like your optimal self. Mm. And I don't know if your supermarkets are set up the same way that ours is, but we recommend that you shop around the perimeter. That when you're walking around the edge, you tend to get your your fruits and your vegetables and your meats. Um, But when you shop in the centre, it tends to be where a lot of your more processed foods are. Like Michael Pollan always says, right? Shop the perimeter of the store. (laughs) And it's very wise. Yeah, that's where you get your whole foods. And then, of course, in the middle, that's exactly where you're getting more of the package stuff. Now, again, you know, it's funny. I'm doing a TV segment next week. And one of the things I'm talking about, well, the segment is on ultra processed foods, but I look at it in three categories. I look at it, there's the whole foods and the unprocessed foods. There's the minimally and there's the processed foods. And then there's the ultra processed foods. So if you can always choose, like you said, choose from the whole foods and the unprocessed foods. Those are our fruits and our vegetables. Those are, you know, these are, those are pasta, things that haven't been altered and they're generally a single ingredient. And then you could move to your minimally processed foods and they have might they still, they're, could be minimally processed, like a granola bar, let's say, but they don't necessarily have ingredients that they're going to use that are bad for us, like the, like the Scary 7 that we talked about today. So just being mindful of those categories and always try to choose from the first two as opposed to the ultra process. Because there was a recent study that was done, they surveyed you know thousands of, I think it was like average age was about 55 and it was thousands of, of people. And they, they saw that from the result of that study is that there's a higher propensity to having heart disease for people that ate the ultra processed foods. So if you can't avoid them, they're just, they're not healthy for us. They don't have the nutrition like you talked about, Jen, especially when there are healthier options out there for us. Couldn't have said it better. (laughs) Thank you so much, Andrea. Do you want to tell the ladies how they can find you if they're interested in following you? Yeah, for sure. So we have a podcast called Morphous. So M-O-R-P-H-U-S for menopause. And I interview a lot of amazing people like yourself. And we talk about a whole bunch of different topics about perimenopause and menopause. And then we also have a YouTube channel. You can look it up um, under Naturally Savvy. So that's two L's and a V, which right now we're hosting our Morphous videos right there. So it doesn't have its own name right now, but we, all of our videos pretty much are talking about menopause. And then we are, our website, depending when you're posting this, Jen, should be up shortly. It's wearemorphous.com. And so W-E-A-R-E Morphous, M-O-R-P-H-U-S.com. And that will be up shortly. So we could um, just, we put out a lot of articles and just to help educate people and naturallysavvy.com. So a lot of places and social media, Andrea Donsky. Wow, I actually went looking for a website last night. So I'm glad to hear that there's one in the process because Naturally Savvy is such a great resource. So much content there in one spot. So it's exciting to know that you're going to have the new one that's menopause specific, but I can imagine it's also going to be a great resource full of so many handouts and information. Thank you so much for your time today, Andrea. I've loved having you on and I'm sure my listeners will get a lot of value out of the content that you've provided, especially number eight. (laughs) So thank you for your time and ladies, until next time, bye for now.
Thank you for listening to Menopause Natural Solutions. This podcast contains general information about menopause. It is provided as a guide and it is not intended to replace medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. If you have enjoyed today's episode, please leave a rating and review.